Hello, I hope you're all well. Uh, welcome to this presentation on the British in South Africa, 1857 to 1895. And you can see the question there, Britain's policies towards the indigenous peoples of Southern Africa were inconsistent in the years 1857 to 1895. Now this was a question in last year's exam paper, although actually it was up to 1890, but I've made it up to 1895. And this presentation will help you, um, or not completely, you could do some of your own thinking, but it will um, give you some ideas as to how to answer this question. Now South Africa, um, its European history, or the aspects of European involvement starts with the Dutch establishing a trading post and a resupply post in what became Cape Town because it was on the route to the Dutch East Indies. And that led to Dutch farmers migrating there um, to resupply the ships en route. And of course, over the years, they pushed further and further into the interior. And the Dutch for farmer is Boer, so they're known as the Boers. Now, the British acquired Cape Colony during the Napoleonic Wars when the Dutch were uh, being occupied, or Holland was being occupied by the French. Uh, and they never returned it. There was an agreement made, and the British took over Cape Colony. Uh, this did not sit very well with the, the Boer farmers. And as we'll see, uh, they moved north for reasons that will be explained in the next slide. This slide has a picture of a diamond mine on it, jumping slightly ahead. Um, but as you'll see, diamonds become of crucial importance. Now, the, the next slide is about this great trek north that the Boers undertook um, in the 1830s. And uh, you can see it goes across a vast area of land, the Karoo. Uh, it's a place I know I have some experience of having broken down in a car that ran out of petrol. It wasn't my fault. In the crew, we had to push the vehicle for two hours till we reached a petrol station. But that's by the by. Also, in this slide, you'll see a picture of the Vortrekker Monument, which is in Pretoria. It's still there. It was built in the 1930s at the height of Afrikaner uh, confidence. Uh, it's a testament to their identity as sort of a chosen people battling through the wilderness. Um, but of course, in a post apartheid South Africa, uh, the dynamics of that uh, have changed very much. Now, much of our course so far has focused on the relationship between the British and the Boers, but uh, we also need to look at the relationship with the uh, indigenous peoples there. Um, and one of them is the Koza, uh, the Koza tribe, who are still of great importance in South Africa. Many members of the ANC are from the Koza tribe. And um, they were on the eastern fringe of the Cape. And numerous wars were fought against them by the British uh, and the Boers. But it, when you come to consider um, how the Southern African peoples fared under British rule, you need to do some research on the Koza. Now, when we look at the policies of the British towards the indigenous peoples of Southern Africa, um, there does seem to be an inconsistency, which I'd like to look into. And there are several instances of um, groups of people, of tribes, appealing to the British for protection uh, usually against the Boers. Um, and in this case, it was the Greco people who wanted protection against the Orange Free State. Um, the discovery of diamonds in 1871 changed the dynamics and makes it this sort of more or less a wasteland very important. But the Greco themselves were an interesting people, as you'll see from the next slide. So even though the Greco were appealing for uh, protection against the Boers of the Orange Free State. In some senses, they were they were Boers themselves. Um, they spoke Afrikaans. Uh, they gave themselves Afrikaner names. Uh, here you see Andreas Waterboer. Um, but they were descendants of um, relationships between Boer men and uh, the Khoi or the San or Swana woman, women. And um, they, they identified, they had this sort of identity which was a mixture of Afrikaner and indigenous African, um, but uh, they had quite a strong sense of identity. Uh, they were able to ride horses as well, and they, would, and they also had access to weapons quite often from those who'd been working in the mines would bring back weapons that they'd bought. Um, but they appealed to the British for protection, uh, and they were absorbed 
uh, by Britain in 1871. Another example of an indigenous peoples repealing to the British for protection was the case of Basutuland. They had been at war with the Orange Free State, like the Greek people had been, uh, and they appealed to the British High Commissioner to be annexed and protected by the British Empire, which they were in 1868. But then in 1871, Cape Colony decided to annex it instead, and this led to a revolt, which was put down by a combination of Cape Colony forces and British forces, but in 1884 it was reincorporated into the British Empire. The one reason why it remained self-governing was that the um, Basutu people were quite good at uh, fighting. Uh, they were very good horsemen. They had access to weapons. Uh, it's quite a hilly, mountainous country, and uh, it wasn't worth a, a continuous campaign. I think also the fact they had no notable mineral resources may have been a factor, um, but it retained its independence uh, to this day. The next example of appealing to the British for help you're familiar with, this is uh, the um, missionary Mackenzie, John Mackenzie, uh, realising that um, his flock, the people that he uh, was the missionary to, were under threat from uh, Boers, Boer incursions, taking their territory, sometimes stealing people to be slaves, and he lobbied the British to annex Bechuanaland land from 1867 onwards which they finally did in 1884, but it was split into um, North and South Bechuan land, which was to cause complications, which will be explained in the next slide. Now, as I said in the previous slide, Bechuan land was divided into the Bechuan land protectorate, north of the Malopo River, and British Bechuan land, south of the Malopo River. And Cecil Rhodes wanted the northern part to also be incorporated into um, well a, a land that could be settled by Europeans and exploited by Europeans and in fact he wanted it to become part of Rhodesia um, which would have opened up huge mineral reserves to him because although there wasn't much mineral wealth in Rhodesia as he found out there was to be huge amounts found in um, the Bechuan land protectorate later on. Anyway um, King Karma uh, the king of the, the Swana people he traveled to Great Britain uh, he met the Queen uh, his identity as a Christian helped him a lot. He was a teetotaler. He was a genuine Christian, I think. And um, he succeeded. Uh, and Cecil Rhodes, of course, was also discredited because it was the same time as the fiasco of the Jamson Raid. Uh, so it's an interesting example of a king uh, showing some diplomatic skill and understanding how to appeal to the British establishment to retain his more or less independence. I mean, they had British administrators there, um, a British-run police force, but he retained his power as the king and he retained his territory, most of it intact. Now this is the end of the first part of the presentation. The second part of the presentation um, will look at the, well, the record of negative activity um, by the British in terms of exploitation, um, ruthlessness, uh, treachery, uh, so that you can have a balanced view of British policies towards the peoples of South Africa in this period.